The, uh, the committee will come to order, and uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. The hearing is entitled, The Impact of the DOL, DOL Fiduciary Rule on Capital Markets. And I now recognize myself uh, for two minutes to give an opening statement. Uh, now more than ever, sound financial advice has become critical for every individual looking to invest and save for their future. Every day, millions of Americans are working to achieve financial independence by using an investment advisor or a broker-dealer to help them plan and prepare for a prosperous retirement. However, the Department of Labor's complex fiduciary rule not only fails to protect customers, it harms them by driving up costs and limiting investor choice. According to research by the American Action Forum, the DOL fiduciary rule is the most expensive regulatory action of 2016 and the second most expensive non-environmental rule since 2015. The rule has the potential to increase consumer costs by $46 billion or approximately $800 uh, annual per account, $800 annually per account, in addition to the $1,500 in duplicative fees for retirement savers that have already paid a fee on their commission-based account. So not only is the DOL denying American savers and small business access to investment advice and limiting their choice in investment products, but it is also crippling them in added costs. Why is the federal government paralyzing hardworking Americans who are trying to save for retirement? Like so many big government policies, this misguided rule hurts the very people it supports, claiming, uh, claiming that it would help low and middle income families. By increasing costs, the fiduciary rule is having a direct effect on the marketplace, enforcing advisors to limit their services to only those accounts that can handle higher costs. This ultimately prices out the low and middle income savers that would benefit the most from having access to this information and financial advice. How is this the best interest for those trying to save for their retirement? The federal government should not be limiting consumers' choice as Americans work towards achieving retirement savings goals. Instead, the federal government should be providing these investors with the tools that they need to build a better future. As we continue to mount regarding the millions of American families uh, who are unable to save for retirement, Congress should be making it easier for these families to save, not making it more difficult. This should be an issue where members of both parties can stand together. Putting the interests of hardworking Americans first is the only way that government can help all savers achieve financial security. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee. Well, actually, I think we're going to go to, uh, we're going to have uh, the, the ranking member uh, do her opening statement, and then I have a couple of other uh, folks on our side of the aisle. So with that, chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes for an opening statement. This, this thank you for, for calling this, and I thank uh, our distinguished panelists for being here today. This hearing addresses a very important issue, the Department of Labor's fiduciary duty rule. I am a supporter of the rule because it provides critical protections to Americans who are saving for retirement. And I'm glad that even the Republican Labor Secretary, Secretary Acosta, appears to agree that the fiduciary rule is an important protection that should not be tossed out. The fiduciary role is a much needed update of the rules governing, invest advisement, uh, governing investment advice to retirement savers, and it will plug some key, key holes in our regulatory system. The rule advances a very simple principle. If you are giving investment advice to a retirement savers and you are being compensated for your advice, then you have to put your customers interests first. This is just common sense, and no one would oppose this principle. We should also remember that most investors already think it is the law, even though it isn't. So really, the DOL rule is simply updating the law to reflect what investors already believe is the law. When President Trump took office, he required the Labor Department to conduct a review of the fiduciary rule to determine whether or not the start date for the rule should be delayed, either for a short period of time or indefinitely. After conducting the review, the Labor Department concluded that it could not justify delaying the start date for a very long and ordered that the core aspects of the fiduciary rule would take effect on June 9th. 
This conclusion was based on the overwhelming benefits that investors will enjoy under the rule. According to the Council of Economic Advisors, this rule will save consumers roughly 17 billion, that is billion, dollars per year. The Labor Department ran its own numbers again and concluded that delaying implementation of the rule past June 9th would simply be too costly for re retirement investors. Now I, now I know there were some concerns about the implementation of this rule when it was first proposed back in 2015. But of, instead of simply opposing the entire rule, some of us, particularly on the Democratic side, actually engaged with the Labor Department and got the vast majority of those technical issues fixed in the final rule. I wrote my own letter to the DOL on the proposed rule asking for six technical fixes and clarifications, and DOL made all six changes that I asked for in the final rule. And I was very pleased that the final rule, with the final rule, because I believe that it properly balances the need to protect retirement investors with the need to streamline compliance costs. Unfortunately, this hearing will also address yet another legislative proposal that would repeal the fiduciary rule. I'm disappointed that we're going through this exercise again. How many more times do these efforts to repeal the fiduciary rule need to fail before my colleagues on the other side of the aisle realize that this is not a productive use of time and that the only realistic way to make changes to the rule is to engage with the Labor Department on reasonable changes that don't harm investors. Believe me, they are responsible. Every issue that I am aware of that my constituents raised, they addressed, and they took care of six that I raised myself. By repealing the fiduciary rule, this bill would leave millions of Americans saving for retirement without the protections that we've seen time and time again are necessary. According to a letter from the Consumer Federation of America, this bill will, quote, dramatically weaken existing protections for retirement savers without providing meaningful new protections for investors in non-retirement accounts. And I'd like to enter this letter into the record and the letter that I wrote myself and achieve the changes. Without objection. So I'm very concerned that by repealing the DOL re rule and replacing it with a watered down vague standard that wouldn't even take effect for a year and a half, this bill would undermine the retirement security of millions of middle-class Americans. But I look forward to a robust debate and to hearing from our witnesses. And I do want to note that this was uh, one of President Obama's main, major goals because he felt like it would help and protect people. I yield back. Thank Gentle you. Ladies, time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, uh, the vice chairman of the uh, subcommittee, Mr. Hultgren, for one minute. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Henserling uh, for his help in getting this uh, hearing today, but especially uh, Chairman Heisinger for all his work of convening this and pulling together a great panel to be able to present to us. I've been proud to work with them and others to fight for retirees in my district and across the country to protect their access to retirement advice and the investment products that will help them build their nest egg that they'll need. <coughs> Excuse me, as someone who is a licensed financial advisor, I'm extremely concerned with the overly prospective regulatory framework that the Department of Labor has proposed for retirement accounts. As I said before, and as we've discussed in this committee over and over, the Obama administration's fiduciary rule is not workable. My constituents, especially those with low retirement account balances, cannot afford for this rule to go into effect as currently proposed. If we are going to institute a fiduciary standard, we need to do it right. That's why I've supported efforts such as legislation sponsored by my colleague Ann Wagner for the Securities and Exchange Commission, the primary investor protection regulator, regulator with the proper expertise and resources to act first and be generally more engaged in this process. I look forward to the witnesses' testimony today so this committee can understand the compliance challenges that are underway and so we can hear recommendations on what actions Congress can take now that the Labor Department's rule is finalized. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired, and, and with that, I would like to recognize uh, the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, uh, for two minutes, and she is the author of the discussion draft uh, that in the first 
Uh, article repeals it, but in the second then puts in an SEC regime. Uh, and uh, with that, the gentlelady is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Heisinga. This is a very important hearing today focusing on critical issue that threatens the access of affordable and reliable retirement investment advice for millions of low and middle income Americans. America is in a retirement savings crisis today, and Washington needs to be empowering individuals to save for retirement, not making it more difficult. The current Department of Labor fiduciary rule will leave Americans that are just starting to build their retirement savings without access to financial advice or paying more for fewer options and decreased service. Republicans on this committee have for years been warning about the harmful effects this rule will have, and unfortunately, we are starting to see those with the rule now partially in effect on June 9th. I look forward to hearing our witnesses discuss their experiences and observations of the market leading up to and after the rule's implementation. To remedy these issues we've seen develop, I have prepared, in fact, a discussion draft, as the chairman has noted, for consideration that would apply a workable best interest standard for broker-dealers when providing investment advice without losing access for such advice for millions of low- and middle-income investors. This legislation would also keep this issue under the jurisdiction of the SEC, the expert regulator who has the experience of overseeing the industry. Broker-dealers should provide advice that is in their customers' best interest. And this draft bill will make that absolutely clear with a standard that applies to both investment and retirement accounts, unlike the Department of Labor's rule. Mr. Chairman, this has been a bipartisan issue in the past, and I'd like to thank my colleagues on this committee across the aisle who have worked with me in the past on this, and I hope that we can all work on this draft bill together going forward. And I yield back. General Lady's time has expired. Well, today we welcome the testimony of a, uh, of a great panel in front of us here. First, we have Mr. David Nock, President of the First Global on behalf of the Financial Services Institute. Uh, we have Mr. Mark Halloran, uh, Senior Director, Head of Industry and Regulatory Strategies, uh, Force Transamerica on behalf of the American Council of Life Insurers. Uh, Mr. Jerome Lombard, uh, President, Private Client Group at Janie Montgomery Scott, LLC, on behalf of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. Uh, Ms. Christina uh, for, uh, Fervita, uh, Director of Financial Security and Consumer Affairs for AARP, and Mr. Doug, Douglas Holtz Eakin, President, American Action Forum. And uh, each of you will be uh, recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony, and without objection, each of your written statements will also be made part of the record. Uh, with that, Mr. Nock, you are uh, recognized for five minutes. Well, good morning, Chairman Heisinga, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the subcommittee. I'm David Nock. President of First Global based in Dallas, Texas. I'm a certified investment management analyst with nearly 20 years of experience in the financial services industry. First Global is the largest independently owned wealth management partner to CPA and legal firms across America. I'm here representing the Financial Services Institute who advocates on behalf of independent financial advisors and independent financial services firms and is a strong supporter of a uniform fiduciary standard. I'm here today to discuss the DOL fiduciary rule and its impact on retirement savers. I believe strongly that the DOL rule adds unnecessary complexity to an already complicated regulatory environment. The DOL rule's intricate regulatory framework raises new barriers to serving millions of Americans. Let me start by sharing some examples of problems with the rule, beginning with its impact on investors. In many cases, investors with small account balances are losing access to lower cost, commission-based solutions due to the DOL rule. For example, one of the lowest cost methods for clients to own mutual funds is to custody them directly with the mutual fund company, often known in our industry as direct business. Since 2016, the number of accounts held by our clients directly with mutual fund companies has dropped nearly 10%, and the number of new accounts established has dropped 19% during the first six months of 2017. We expect this trend to accelerate, and by the end of this year, anticipate that the total number of accounts held in these programs will drop 
by more than a third. We're also challenged to offer a viable, cost-effective solution for small employer retirement plans, particularly simple IRAs, where account balances can be as low as $100. Many of these accounts are offered on a commission basis and will be subject to the best interest contract. Due to the threat of class action lawsuits, many of our affiliated firms will no longer offer these plans to small business clients, and some will end their existing relationships. In fact, since the start of 2016, we've seen the number of simple IRA accounts drop by over 20%. We project that these accounts will shrink from the 2016 levels by 28% before the end of this year, and by 41% by the end of 2018. Now, furthermore, the DOL rule creates significant new disclosures that are cumbersome and expensive to create, will confuse investors with their sheer volume and complexity, and are simply not necessary to hold financial advisors to a fiduciary standard of care. As of the January 1 applicability date for a small commission-based account, which can be opened with as little as a $50 initial investment utilizing the best interest contract exemption, our clients will receive nearly 100 pages of paperwork with 70 of those pages being disclosure. When the prospectus is added, disclosure pages grow to 81% of the total 145-page paperwork burden imposed on clients, all to open a $50 account. Now, finally, my testimony would not be complete without dedicating at least one paragraph to defend the honor of the CPA financial advisors I have the privilege to serve. Every CPA financial advisor I know is called to serve for two reasons. They enjoy solving complex problems, and they enjoy doing good for others. And offering financial services to their clients lies at the intersection of this calling. These people do what is right for their clients, not because of a rule or a standard of care, but because it is simply the right thing to do. Clients in our industry need reasonable and effective regulation. And it is a dishonor to the vast majority of our profession who are called to serve their communities first and happen to earn a living for doing so to assume they're only acting in their self-interests. It's simply not what I see. What I see is the family member suffering from cancer who can focus on his recovery because his financial affairs are in order, or the widow who relies on her financial advisor to transition to life without her spouse, or the person entering retirement who can enjoy the fruits of their hard work because they have an advisor who helped them plan and save and who now guides them on living a dignified life sustained by the power of choice. My wish for you is to see what I see and help independent financial advisors like ours all across America serve more clients, serve them better, and serve them more completely by reducing their regulatory burden without reducing the standard of care. I thank the chairman, the ranking member, and the rest of the subcommittee for allowing me to share my thoughts in this matter, and I look forward to answering your questions. In a rare move, the gentleman yields back with additional time, so thank you. <laughs> Okay, keep moving along. Mr. Halloran, you are uh, recognized for five minutes. Ranking Member Maloney and members of the committee, thank you for uh, the opportunity to testify before you today on behalf of the American Council of Life Insurers. As was stated, I'm the Senior Director of Industry and Regulatory Strategy at Transamerica. Transamerica is one of the nation's largest uh, uh, pr providers of financial products, insurance, and annuities. And we work with Americans to help them save for retirement uh, insure against risk and build solid financial foundations. ACLI supports reasonable and appropriately tailored rules that require all sales professionals to act in the best interest of their of customers. Rules impacting savings, and in particular retirement savings, must be appropriately tailored, effective, straightforward, and consistent, and provide America's savers and retirees with the ability to achieve their financial and retirement security goals. A best interest standard should protect the interest of retail investors and ensure consumers can access the full range of financial advice and products. A best interest standard should be administered by the prudential regulators that have the most ex expertise and experience in investor protection and financial markets. The SEC and the state insurance regulators are best positioned for that role and are the appropriate authorities for oversight of financial professionals. The SEC, state insurance regulators, and the Department of Labor should work together to establish a harmonized standard of care that applies across the entire relationship between financial professionals and consumers. We are very encouraged by the recent statements in this regard by the SEC and the DOL with respect to their plans to work together in this regard as well. 
ACLI, <coughs> pardon me, supports the discussion draft being reviewed by the subcommittee at today's hearing. ACLI thanks Chairman Heisenga, Representative Ann Wagner, and the other members of the committee for their strong leadership on this issue. The best interest standard under the discussion draft would apply holistically to recommendations regarding any asset, not just the one dimension of the relationship that involves ERISA plan and IRA assets. The standard would be consistent across all aspects of consumers' finances, providing clear and consistent rules for both financial professionals and consumers. The discussion draft harmonizes the various bodies of law and regulation applicable to the sale of insurance and annuity products at the retail level. To harmonize the regulation of advice to retail investors, the discussion draft facilitates coordination by the appropriate prudential regulators. The draft bill sensibly places responsibility for issuing regulations in the hands of the primary prudential regulators, the SEC, and the state insurance regulators. Importantly, the draft bill would also place a statutory obligation on the SEC to coordinate and cooperate with state insurance regulators. The draft would also install important statutory safeguards to permit transaction-based financial professionals, including broker-dealer representatives, re registered representatives, and insurance agents to continue to offer products and services to retail customers under traditional compensation models. These safeguards would effectively preserve retail investor access to information, freedom of choice over how to pay for financial advice, and a robust competitive marketplace for insured retirement solutions. The Department of Labor's fiduciary rule is wrong, is the wrong approach because it harms middle income savers and limits consumer choices. However well intentioned the rule, the rule is, it makes it much harder for the average American family to access financial advice and save for retirement. The fee-based advice model favored in the DOL regulation may not always be the right model for the small and medium account holders. That is particularly true for buy and hold investors and purchasers of annuity products that are designed for long-term retirement goals. Many fee-based arrangements do not include options for the purchase of annuities, which are the only products available to consumers and retirees that guarantee lifetime income. Furthermore, the DOL regulation is diminishing access to advice at a time when financial advice is more important than ever. An advice gap has developed for small and medium retirement account holders who do not meet the higher account minimums for fee-based arrangements. Less advice from financial professionals can contribute to reduced savings on the part of working Americans and diminished retirement security for retirees in need of guaranteed lifetime income through annuities. The discussion draft would ensure that consumers have more access to information and advice and more choices about how to pay for advice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Lombard, welcome. Uh, we appreciate you being here and your time here. And with that, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Huizinga, Ranking Member Maloney, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm Jerry Lombard, president of the private client group at Janney Montgomery Scott. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, SIFMA and share our perspective on the best path forward to establish a best interest standard for the broker-dealer industry. We are grateful to this committee for its willingness to consider legislation that would allow the Securities and Exchange Commission to establish a best interest standard for broker-dealers that would create a high standard of care for retail clients across all accounts. On June 9th, some key provisions in the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule became applicable. And as an industry, we're beginning to see the harmful impact on America's retirement savers, limiting product choice and access to advice while increasing costs. At Janney, we have already experienced many of these issues. Our customers and advisors are very confused by the phalanx of new DOL rules applying to retirement accounts. They do not understand why there are now two sets of rules, one for retirement accounts and one for taxable brokerage accounts. Since June 9th, clients are now restricted from making certain investments in their retirement accounts. By year end, we estimate upwards of 10,000 of our client retirement accounts, about one in eight, will be relegated to a no advice service desk as they are too small for the risks imposed by the DOL or too costly to be placed into an advisory account that would remove the supposed conflicts the DOL is trying to relegate how switching small retirement savers from a full service advisor to a no advice service desk is in these clients' best interest, I will never understand. 
It is the position of SIFMA that the right answer for investors is a consistent best interest standard that could apply across all types of accounts, but does not have the additional onerous conditions created by the DOL rule. A best interest standard done right by the SEC, the expert agency responsible for broker-dealer standards of conduct, would provide protection for retail clients without a bifurcated compliance regime imposed on those same market participants by different regulators. We're greatly encouraged by the SEC's June 1st request for public comment on standards of conduct for investment advisors and broker-dealers. It is SIFMA's intention to share with the SEC our desire they consider establishing a best interest standard for broker-dealers that mirrors the elements of the impartial conduct standards under the DOL rule, but unlike the DOL rule, would apply across all broker-dealer accounts, not just retirement accounts. For that reason, the DOL should, at a minimum, delay the January 2018 applicability date to allow the SEC to lead the effort to put in place a standard that works for all accounts. Congresswoman Wagner's legislative draft provides this path forward by establishing an SEC-applied principles-based standard to ensure that all broker-dealer recommendations about securities are driven by the best interest of retail clients. We firmly believe that this approach would provide a number of significant regulatory efficiencies and investor protections, benefits which would enhance the existing suitability obligation under FINRA rules to create a heightened and more stringent best interest standard for the benefit of retail clients, apply across all security recommendations made to retail clients in all broker-dealer accounts, not just limited to IRA accounts build upon and fit seamlessly with in the existing and long-standing securities regulatory regime for broker-dealers, coupled with robust examination, oversight, and enforcement by the SEC, FINRA, and state securities regulators, and be akin and well aligned with the investment advisor standard under the Advisors Act, insofar as the new standard would include a duty of loyalty and a duty of care an obligation to manage investment costs and would require upfront disclosure to clients of important information. Thus, we greatly appreciate Congresswoman Wagner's work on this legislative discussion draft, and we look forward to continuing to work with her and this committee on language that ensures the best interest standard established in the bill operates in harmony and consistency with all existing standards of conduct, including the current broker-dealer, investment advisor, and DOL rule regulatory frameworks, as well as any future rulemaking by the SEC or FINRA. In doing this, we will help relieve America's retirement savers from the burdens that have already arisen as a consequence of the DOL's misguided rule. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vervita, you are uh, recognized for five minutes. On behalf of our 38 million members and Americans saving for retirement, AARP thanks Chairman Huizenga, Ranking Member Maloney, and the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. AARP has enthusiastically supported the fiduciary rule requiring retirement advice that minimizes conflicts, is solely in the interest of the investor, and which is provided with the care, skill, and diligence that a prudent person would use. Today we are joined by several AARP members who are here to show support for the rule. In 2015, AARP members submitted close to 60,000 messages to the Department of Labor and delivered over 26,000 petitions to the House Financial Services Committee. You have those petitions before you today. We are frequently communicating with our members about the rule, including in multiple articles in the AARP Bulletin, which is the world's largest circulation publication. In surveys, we have always found that people overwhelmingly want fiduciary advice. In collaboration with the North American Securities Administrators Association, we have also developed a tool to help investors determine if their advisor is a fiduciary. Many states also agree that the fiduciary rule is needed. Earlier this year, nine attorneys general, including the AGs from New York and North Carolina, sent supportive letters to the Department of Labor. Additionally, five states, including Missouri, already impose a fiduciary standard on brokers in their states. Most recently, Nevada established a fiduciary standard with the support of AARP. The financial services industry itself generally agrees that investment advice should be provided in the best interest of investors, which is unsurprising given that these standards have been in place since ERISA was enacted in 1974. 
Indeed, registered investment advisors and certified financial planners have for decades successfully provided fiduciary advice. Repealing the fiduciary rule would be very costly to retirement investors. Savers could lose 17% of their 401k account over 20 years and close to 25% of the account over 30 years as a result of conflicted advice. That is the equivalent of five years of retirement income. The risk of loss is greatest for IRA investors who are moving their life savings from a more protected uh, 401k to a significantly less protected IRA. Small accounts are especially vulnerable to conflicted advice because they have fewer economic resources to replace lost savings. The rule has overall resulted in lower fees and better financial advice for savers. Many firms have already incurred compliance costs, but we have not seen prices increase for investors served by those companies. New products and services have developed to meet consumer demand for lower fees and greater transparency, and the rule does not prohibit any type of product or service. Given the nearly $8 trillion in assets in IRAs and the almost $5 trillion in 401k plans, ARP is confident that financial firms will continue to innovate and compete for America's nest egg. AARP does agree that the Securities and Exchange Commission should act in addition to, but not in lieu of, the Department of Labor. We appreciate that the draft bill seeks to impose a best interest standard on broker-dealers, but the bill fails to define that standard as a fiduciary standard, which the bill does not strengthen, and which may even meet the bill's benchmark. Many brokers market themselves today as financial advisors, and investors can bear high costs for investments that satisfy a suitability standard, but not a fiduciary standard. The bill does not specify how conflicts should be managed. Disclosure alone is not adequate and neither compels mitigation of nor shields investors from conflicts of interest. Finally, the draft bill could potentially preclude both the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Department of Labor from taking action to adopt stronger protections for investors even if the market evolves with unanticipated consequences. We thank the committee for the opportunity to share AARP's views on the Department of Labor's fiduciary rule and on the draft bill, which would repeal that rule and replace it with a discretionary best interest standard for broker-dealers. AARP remains committed to the strongest possible fiduciary standard for retirement investment advice and recommends a similar standard for all other advice that will promote and protect the financial security of American families. With that, Dr. holtz we uh, recognize you for five minutes and welcome you here. Uh, thank you, Chairman Heisinger, Ranking Member Maloney, and members of the committee for the privilege to be here today to discuss the implications of the DOL fiduciary rule for capital markets. Uh, I would like to note at the outset, there's a consensus about the desirability of a standard of conduct to protect small retirement savers against any bad actors that might shortchange them in their desire to protect their lifestyle. Uh, the only issue is whether such a standard is workable, and I believe the DOL rule is not workable, and I applaud efforts to replace it with something that's uh, more effective. Uh, I'm gonna make three very simple points briefly, and then I look forward to answering your questions. The first is that the DOL fiduciary rule is very expensive, and uh, this expense derives from changes in business practice that the rule will force on the, the uh, retirement industry, and those changes in the end will be most harmful to small retirement savers and they will bear the brunt of the cost of this rule. First of all, uh, the rule is very costly. Uh, the chairman noted at the outset, the American Action Forum uh, has an ongoing effort to track the cost of federal regulation, not just financial regulation, but across the board in all agencies. And the fiduciary rule was the single most expensive rule in 2016. It's, uh, our estimate is $31.5 billion, plus another $2 billion annually uh, to comply with the rule. Uh, this is the second most expensive non-environmental rule since 2005. And so it stands out as an extremely costly enterprise. Those costs derive really from, from two main things. Uh, the first is the move to primarily fee-based uh, uh, accounts. Uh, if you look at the data for the 57 million uh, individual retirement accounts, two facts jump right out. Uh, first fact is the vast majority of them are quite small. 74% uh, are under um, $100,000. And the other fact is that they are largely in commission-based accounts. And so 
this rule, which would eliminate the capacity to do those commission-based accounts, by and large, would move people into the fee-based world, which is much more expensive. Our estimate, as the chairman noted, is this, this size amounts to about $800 per year per account, uh, an amount that many people simply will not be able to come up with. Uh, for those who are already in somewhat of a fee-based account, there will be an additional $1,500 in duplicative fees. And so these are, are costs that these individuals are going to bear. It's also quite likely that because of the nature of, of the service required in this fee-based world, the minimum account balances will be raised. And if they were raised even to $20,000, you'd lose about 40% um, uh, of, the, of the accounts. And so the threat of pricing people out and the threat of uh, having them dropped from investment advice is very real in the data. Um, this is also not a hypothetical from two other perspectives. Uh, number one, we have seen this experiment run roughly in, in the same fashion in the United Kingdom where commission-based accounts were, in fact, banned uh, in 2013. And the result, as I note in my written statement, was uh, a more than doubling of the number of the fraction of firms that required 100,000 pounds as the minimum account balance. Uh, about 45% uh, of firms <coughs> report that they provided very little advice to any small accounts. They just didn't do that anymore. And you saw uh, people get less and less retirement advice. It's also begun to happen in the United States. We've seen companies like MetLife and AIG exit the business. We've seen companies like Raymond James move to a fee-based uh, model. So the notion that these, these changes would occur, I think, is very real. The second route for these costs is uh, the, the potential for litigation. Uh, the best interest contact is, uh, uh, in, in the eyes of most people, uh, a real opening for additional litigation. If you look at the data for FINRA, there were 4,000 complaints filed in 2016. Uh, only 158 were found in favor of, the, of the, cons the complainant, the consumer. That suggests there's going to be a lot of litigation at high cost with no particular benefit to, to the individuals, and, and that's a concern. Obviously, you could insure against that, that litigation cost, but that's, that's a cost of doing business. It's going to show up in these accounts. And so between the, the litigation, which the DOL recognized in doing its cost estimate, but only put it $150 million a year, most people think that's too low, and the movement to fee-based um, uh, accounts, you're going to see additional costs. Those costs are going to hurt the small retirement saver. They're going to price <clears throat> excuse me, some people out of the market. There are going to be some increases in minimum balances, which are going to preclude people from getting advice. And a ballpark estimate of the number of people affected looks like 28 million, a number equal to half of the number of IRA accounts right now. And so this is a substantial threat to the actual advice that we want small retirement savers to get. And I encourage the committee to move to a more workable approach to standards of conduct. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate uh, your testimony. And uh, with that, the chair will recognize himself for, uh, for five minutes. And I just want to quickly uh, jump um, on what you were talking about. I mean, obviously, your experience as, uh, with the Council of Economic Advisors and then head of the CBO, you, you've certainly been through this. Um, I have had conversations with those companies, some who have shifted uh, to fee-based uh, uh, regimes, and they freely acknowledge that they are going to make more money doing this with fewer clients. Uh, they, it, it's a marketing tool that some are using, and what's a little frustrating to me is that this is being somehow portrayed as um, if you don't like this Department of Labor fiduciary rule, then you must not like savers. Well, I can tell you this, my nearly 86-year-old mother, please don't tell her I told you how old she is, um, <laughs> Mom doesn't have a, a broker on Wall Street. It's Bruce and Brandon on 8th Street in Holland, Michigan. That's who her advisors are. That's who my advisors are. You know, these are the people that we go to. It's not some, it's not some uh, you know, massive building in, in, uh, in New York or some other place. And, and I think it's important to note that, uh, you know, the, the reason why the Obama administration did what it did is it could not get a bipartisan board of the Securities and Exchange Commission to agree on a fiduciary rule, but they were able to get a political appointee at the Department of Labor to move ahead with a politically driven rule, who ironically and interestingly enough is now head of the DNC. So I, I think it's, it's, it's just fascinating when this is getting portrayed as somehow political, when this is really about making sure that people like my mom and people like me coming up and others are going to have the ability, and my constituents are going to have the ability to get the advice that they have. So, um, 
you know, as, as you had pointed out, 41% of the U.S. working households ages 55 to 64 have no retirement savings. 55% of households aged 55 to 64 have less than $25,000 in savings. And only 23% of baby boomers believe their savings will last them through retirement. Uh, even more disturbing is that many experts believe that this figure is frankly optimistic. So rather than put forward a rule that would expand retirement saving opportunities for hardworking Americans, the administration pushed through these regulations with costs that far outweigh any marginal benefits. Uh, equally troubling is the fact that the data released in response to the department's recent July 6 uh, request for information shows that the Obama administration significantly underestimated the negative effects of the rule, and particularly in reducing access to advice for small retirement savers and small businesses. So I'm very quickly, I'm going to go through the panel, and I'd like yes or no uh, responses on a couple of quick questions. Do you support the delay of the applicability uh, date of the DOL fiduciary rule beyond January 1? Mr. Nock? Yes. Mr. Holleran? Yes. Mr. Yes. Holmer? No. No? Yes. Okay. Um, do you support the best interest standard as outlined in the Wagner discussion draft? Mr. Nock? Yes. 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 It's too vague, but we don't think so. I think that's a no. Might be a no. Okay. I think it's a no. Yes. All right. Uh, and then, do you agree that the Securities and Exchange Commission is the expert regulator in this space and should act as the lead agency crafting an applicable rule regulating the standards of care for individualized investment advice? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Again, yes. No, there's a role for both, the yes. DOL and SEC. Yes. Okay. So you don't, you don't agree that the SEC is the actual expert regulator in this because Secretary Acosta has said that they don't have that expertise. We believe that both agencies have expertise. They, they have a that role. Investors expertise. That investors benefit from okay. when, when, both, when both sets right. of expertise Reclaiming apply. my time for this last minute. Do you believe that robo-advisors are better for investors than real people giving advice, Mr. Nock? No. Mr. Halloran? Absolutely not. Mr. Lombard? No. Mr. Rivera? Uh, we do not believe that it's wrong to get advice from robo-advisors and other new technologies. Okay, so I guess that's a no. All right, Mr. Holtzikin. No. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I, uh, I, I am very concerned about how this flaw ruled has impact on the U.S. capital markets as well. I'm even more concerned with its impact on small business owners. And uh, Mr. Nock, I'd like you to address real quickly, how has the DOL fiduciary affected businesses' abilities to offer services for small employer retirement plans such as simple IRAs? And will there be a loss of access for retirement services for small businesses that have not grown large enough to even consider a 401k plan? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. This is where we've seen probably the largest impact so far of the rule and where the financial advisors I work with are most concerned about how to comply. Uh, it's particularly with simple IRAs. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening testimony, we've seen the number of accounts in those programs drop by 20%. And looking forward 18 months, we expect those to continue to drop to a little over 40%. Uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned, and I don't today have a, a workable solution for simple IRAs that our financial advisors are willing to use under the DOL rules currently written. Well, my time has expired, but I'll note that a study conducted by the Chamber of Commerce found that small business owners through SEP and simple type IRA plans provide roughly $472 billion in retirement savings for over 9 million households. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid that in light of this DOL rule, um, uh, those small business owners will stop providing those plans uh, to their employees. So my time has expired, so the uh, chair recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing and assembling such a distinguished, uh, outstanding panel on a critically important uh, issue for retirees and in, pre in protecting investors. Uh, regrettably, most of us have had the experience in our offices, even though we represent very honest and, and wonderful financial institutions and, and uh, wonderful, honest people in the business, but as one of you said, there are bad actors out there. And we've all had the experience where people come to me and say, I put all of my savings with this advisor. They said they would be protected. I've lost everything. What do I do? There's nothing you can do for them. Uh, so the reason this law rule was put in place was to protect people. And President Obama uh, felt passionately about it. And the principle's very simple, that you have to put your customers' interests first. In other words, you can't put making money for yourself over 
over a retiree looking for advice. And it's a higher standard because they are retirees, many of whom have very little money and it needs to be protected. Maybe that's why President Obama felt so passionately about this rule. And he told me that often in the negotiations, we're in a political body, we negotiate all the time. The opposing side wanted the fiduciary rule thrown out and they'd give him X, Y, Z, and he'd say, no, I want the fiduciary rule. It's important to protecting people. Now, many of you have said that it, the regulation is terrible and it should be more regulation efficiency. I, I know firsthand that they will work with you. I took six different problems and had them removed and changed because it made it honestly better and more efficient. And I put the letter in the record. You can read it. Every single recommendation I made after much negotiation, we got it changed. So they'll work with you. If you think you can make it more efficient and more fast, fine. Go to DOL, they'll work with you. And by the way, it's a Republican leader now at DOL that has called for the rule to go in place and says that it will save savings for millions of Americans. And, and also you say you're for investor protections. If you have any ideas for more investor protections, I'm sure DOL will respond to them. This is an important rule that will save people's savings and will have a professionals, most of whom have that same goal anyway. We're just protecting against bad actors. That's what this rule does. So my question is first is to Christina Martin uh, Ferrivida. Um, can you talk about the differences between the DOL's fiduciary rule and this bill's watered down standard? And are the protections that are included in the DOL rule, but not this bill, important to protecting retirement savers? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. So a big concern we have about the discussion draft, and we recognize it's, it's, it's a draft only, is that the standard as described is quite vague. We are concerned that the current suitability standard could even satisfy the benchmark that is described in this bill. And if that would be the case, perhaps that's, that's not correct, but if that would be the case, we don't see how this bill is an improvement on the current situation before the fiduciary rule went into place. The fiduciary rule, very specifically, directs how to manage conflicts. It's more than just disclosure, and disclosure alone is inadequate. We know that when we have done surveys, people who are saving for their retirement, if they understand, they hear someone say, look, I have conflicts of interest, I'll earn a commission based on what I recommend. Ironically, that leads someone to trust that advisor more, even though the conflict is not managed, even though the conflict is not avoided. So disclosure alone is not enough. And the concern we have with this bill is disclosure alone could satisfy the benchmark, suitability could satisfy the benchmark. There are $40 billion that the DOL estimates for IRA investors alone that could be lost to conflicted advice. They have a very strong rule, it helps investors, and we strongly support it. Okay. Now, following up on, on this bill's uh, watered-down standard for broker-dealers, it wouldn't even take effect for 18 months after the bill is enacted, even though the repeal of the DOL a rule would be immediate. And that means for the first 18 months under this bill, brokers would have no duty to act in their client's best interest. Uh, the Labor Department, under a Republican Labor Secretary, concluded that the cost to investors of delaying this rule for even half this long would be absolutely overwhelming. So is it fair to say that the cost to re retirement investors of this 18-month gap would be substantial? The cost would be substantial, and something that I would like to address in statements that have been made this morning, when we talk about the cost of the regulation, and we talk about that in the absence of the cost of conflicted advice to savers, we're missing the big picture. Conflicted advice is not free. It is costing people saving for the retirement, people like the AARP members who are here today in support of the rule. So yes, a delay of 18 months would be very significant on the nest eggs of people saving for their retirement. My time has expired. Lady's time has expired. Uh, with that, uh, the chair recognizes the vice chair of the committee, Mr. Holkren, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you all for being here. 
Uh, Mr. Nock, I represent a district uh, just kind of the far west suburbs of Chicago, many small communities uh, in that area, wonderful place to represent, represent. You talk about this a little bit in your testimony, but I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit further about why the Department of Labor's rule will result in fewer choices of affordable financial advice in smaller communities across the country. Well, thank you, Sarah. I, I, as I talked to the financial CPA financial advisors I work with, perhaps the, the greatest concern they have today is twofold. Um, the biggest one is being exposed to the possibility of class action lawsuits, which is part of the utilization of best interest contract. A number of people on the panel here today have discussed the move to fee-based accounts. Um, as they correctly mentioned, fee-based accounts are typically for larger investors, which means smaller investors will be in relationships with their financial advisors using the best interest contract. Um, there's some concern about be, uh, having that standard applied. Uh, it's not that our financial advisors are worried about accountability. They're worried about being part of class action lawsuits, and they're exiting the marketplace. Mr. Knack, do you believe uh, M&A to absorb compliance costs across economies of scale could contribute to, contribute to monopolies or at least greatly reduce competition in some areas? And what will this mean for investors, my constituents, saving for retirement? I'm sorry, would you re repeat? Yeah, I wondered if you believe uh, M&A uh, uh, would absorb compliance costs okay. across economies of scale, could contribute to monopolies, or at la uh, least uh, greatly reduce competition in some areas, and yeah. ultimately what the cost on sm you know, smaller investors would be. Yeah, I, I do have some concern about that. Uh, some of our financial advisors that we work with have indicated, especially ones who are working with smaller investors, have indicated that they may choose to leave the financial services industry, try to sell their practice. I think the biggest concern I have with that may, may be less about monopoly, at least in our case. I can certainly see it uh, industry-wide, but it's a lot of times these are small financial advisors who are serving small communities. There isn't somebody else in that community in a number of cases to take over services. So that, that's where my M&A concern is for our organization. Dr. Holtzikin, uh, we all agree that cost-benefit analysis is important to policymaking. It doesn't happen very often around this place. Uh, but especially economically significant rules like that finalized by the Department of Labor. You're an economist. Uh, do you believe President Obama's administration conducted a credible cost-benefit analysis before this rule was put out? And what do you think are the most significant flaws in the analysis? I think there are some concerns on, on both sides of the equation. Uh, on the cost side, uh, we think that the DOL rule underestimates the litigation costs significantly, uh, and that, that's a concern. Um, I think on the, the benefit side, uh, the widely cited uh, $17 billion number produced by the Council of Economic Advisors is not an estimate that I think stands up to close scrutiny. We, we've written on this in the past. Uh, there have been other critiques of it, but um, it, it was incomplete in the assets that it, it, it surveyed and covered. Uh, it took rates of return that weren't uh, risk-weighted and, and sort of uh, sort of conventional measures of what is a real financial return. And I think if you, you poke hard at that, you're not going to find $17 billion worth of loss. Okay. Would you uh, agree that the SEC is, uh, would have better perspective for weighing benefits and costs for investors than the Department of Labor? I think they are uh, the primary regulator. They're, they're the perfect uh, entity to be doing this. Thanks. Mr. Nock, back to you. Uh, it would be helpful if you could speak directly to the merits of the draft legislation uh, from Ms. Wagner from Missouri. Uh, that we're discussing today. What will happen if the DOL's rule goes into effect before the SEC is able to implement its own standard? And from an investor protection standpoint, wouldn't my constituents be better served by a uniform standard that applies to both retirement accounts and investment accounts? Well, thank uh, the. I think the biggest thing that will happen if the rule is finalized before this bill is enacted is the, the trend that I was describing in my oral testimony will continue. Um, we'll continue to see a decline in the utilization of the platforms most often offered to uh, investors of small account balances. Direct business, simple IRAs, as I mentioned, will continue to shrink. Uh, I do believe that the rule, that the draft bill has merits and that it will provide a uniform standard of care. Um, it'll cover more than just retirement accounts. I think everyone in this panel would agree um, in a best interest standard being uh, applied to financial advisors working with clients. Um, we would be in favor of seeing that applied across not just retirement accounts, but all of an investor's accounts. The financial advisors I work with work with the entire person. Thank you. I just have a few seconds left and many more questions. Uh, so maybe we'll follow up in writing, if we may. With that, I yield back. 
gentleman yields back. Uh, with that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're in this shape that we're in today because as an original co-sponsor of Dodd-Frank years ago, we told the SEC that they needed to come up with a rule that would raise the broker-dealer standard and more importantly, harmonize, harmonize that standard with the obligations investment advisors have to follow today and not the Department of Labor. It is the SEC that is best suited to do that. Failure of them to take the initiative and to do that and recognize the true role that the Department of Labor plays, we're, we're wandering here because the great need is harmonized. Here's what the law said about this situation in terms of the fiduciary rule. It says that both the SEC and the DOL have a jurisdiction over investment advice that must meet a fiduciary standard and advice that is exempt from such a standard. Specifically, the SEC has jurisdiction over advice to individuals regarding both retirement and non-retirement accounts, but only if the advice relates to securities. In contrast, the DOL has jurisdictions over advice regarding retirement accounts, regardless of whether the advice is securities related. This means that in many circumstances, both the agencies share jurisdiction, while in others, only one agency has jurisdiction. If this is enough evidence to know that these two entities, DOL and SEC, need to harmonize, they didn't do it. So what were we left with? We're left with a bill and to move to define the fiduciary. And I've worked with... Uh, uh, Ms. Wagner before on several of her bills to do that, was the lead Democrat to do that. But uh, because we told the SEC and those bills to do that. But right now, this bill that Ms. Wagner has put before us is a very troubling bill. And let me tell you why. For starters, this discussion draft, I'm glad it's just a discussion, will most certainly undermine the SEC's rulemaking authority in this space because the bill says that no additional obligations related to the standard of care of broker-dealer can be added on top of the one set forth in this discussion draft. This is worrisome. Because what if the drafters of the bill got something wrong? I noticed in my quick read through this, and keep in mind, I only got this bill yesterday, that dual, dual registrants, those firms that duly registered as both broker-dealers and investment advisors, is not even mentioned in the discussion draft. I'm also worried about this because what if the market evolves? We've seen in the past 10 years how retirement savings and investment advice uh, has been flipped on its head because of technology. Imagine what is going to be five years ahead. So tying the hands of the SEC, being over prescriptive as this draft discussion bill is, is dangerous. Additionally, this new bill creates an entirely new standard that isn't a fiduciary standard or a suitability standard. It's something entirely new. And so why, why are we being so prescriptive in drafting of this bill? Why don't we direct the SEC, who are the experts in this, to do their job instead of tying the hands of the SEC and this bill reminds me of a straitjacket. It's like this bill is putting the SEC and almost like forcing them to do their job, to, but yet putting these overly prescriptive uh, in here. Now, finally, this bill would be devastating to low income, to middle income, to senior citizens. 
when you add contrapolations and make it much more complex and complicated, where they can't even understand it, and you have no harmonization in the bill, and you put on top of that prescriptive directions, it's harmful. I'll, I'll do respect to uh, Ms. Wagner, but this is a very troubling bill. I hope we get a chance to work and iron out some of these to make it fair to everyone, Gentlemen's especially time has those at the low income and our seniors. Gentlemen's time has expired. With that, we will turn to the author of the draft legislation, uh, the chairwoman of our oversight and investigation subcommittee, uh, gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, uh, and I, I, I certainly appreciate uh, Congressman Scott and uh, the ability to, to work with you, uh, sir. I, I will say that we have codified the standard, the best district standard, in this draft legislation, which I think is a, a key step forward. I want to thank all of you for appearing today and for your testimony on, um, on the DOL's fiduciary rule on the capital markets and, and how it impacts it, as well as the ability um, of millions of low- and middle-income American families to continue receiving retirement advice. Dr. Holtzikin, in your testimony, you stated that the fiduciary rule as it stands right now was the most expensive regulation of 2016. I think you said even the most expensive since 2005, with $31.5 billion in total costs and $2 billion in annual burdens. You elaborated a little bit about those cost mechanisms. Um, First of all, if, there, if, if you want to add anything to that in terms of how much of these costs would be passed on to, uh, to customers, consumers, uh, those, those retail investors, A, and B, would the cost burdens for firms and consumers be similar under the best interest standard envisioned in the discussion draft? So uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. Um, the, the cost mechanisms, as I mentioned, really are uh, from two sources. Uh, one is the increased likelihood of litigation and the cost to come from directly litigating, uh, and then in some cases uh, choosing to, to purchase insurance against litigation costs. Those are costs of doing business. They will inevitably be passed along to customers in one form or another. That will price some people out of uh, investment advice, and then that way that cost is ultimately very much borne by the least affluent among the retirement savers, and that's a, that's a concern that comes up. Uh, comes through very clearly. Uh, the second cost really is this move to the, the fee-based, more fee-based system. And um, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, the United Kingdom went to uh, this, this entirely fee-based, eliminated the commission-based, and we saw uh, a dramatic increase from 13% to 32% in the, the fraction of firms that required a minimum of 100,000 pounds. And, and to the discussion draft, would the cost burdens be the same? No, um, they'll, be, they, they'll be lower. That's one of the, the, um, the the litigation is clearly going to be much lower standard, and it doesn't uh, drive people out of the commission-based uh, model, and so you're not driven into a fee-based model that's far more expensive. Great. Mr. Nock and Mr. Lombard, could you both um, please take some time to discuss how the best interest standard des described in the discussion draft improves upon the suitability standard currently subjected to broker-dealers? Mr. Nock. Uh, thank you. I, I think one of the areas, and I marked it in here, and we've had a discussion about this, is um, it requires a broker-dealer to avoid, disclose, or otherwise reasonably manage any conflict of interest. So there is a requirement for disclosure, which I think we would agree with, as well as attempts to avoid and manage conflicts of interest. We're also, also asking financial advisors to uphold a duty of loyalty and a duty of care. Um, we have definitions that look substantially similar to what's expected in, let's say, fee-based um, uh, investment advisory accounts as well under an SEC standard. Um, I'm, I'm particularly pleased with seeing that there and applying a, a standard. Mr. Lombard. It's clearly a, a higher standard uh, than the suitability, uh, both duty of loyalty, duty of care, right. which includes uh, the, the prudent management of client assets. I'd also point out that uh, this would apply to all accounts, not just retirement accounts, and that's important to our clients. Um, also, with the SEC and FINRA's examination, oversight, and enforcement capabilities, abilities that are limited at the Department of Labor, I think downstream you're going to get implementation of a best interest standard um, much more effectively by having uh, SEC and FINRA's oversight. Mr. Knott, could you please explain how the discussion draft 
implements an effective and meaningful disclosure system you did a little bit, and effectively mitigates material conflicts of interest. Yeah, this is actually one of the areas where I'm most pleased with the, the discussion draft. I think one of the areas of disclosure that works very well in the fee-based accounts that we have a fiduciary standard today under the SEC is the utilization of the Form ADV. Um, this appears to have a substantially similar disclosure requirement put at the beginning of the relationship. Um, we think that form of disclosure works very well. Um, it, while it adds some to paperwork burden, the paperwork burden of a form like this at the beginning of the process is far less than what's contemplated by the but, DOL rule. But yes or no, does the discussion draft uh, provide a more comprehensive best interest standard than the DOL fiduciary rule by applying to both retirement and investment accounts? Yes. Mr. Holleran? Yes. Yes. Ms. Lombard? Yes. Ms. Ferrita? Yes. I think we answered previously that we feel that it's vague, so we don't think so. That's a no. I think on that's everything a no. From you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you all. General Lady's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the representative from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, for five minutes. Okay. Uh, this is to uh, Ms. Christina Martin Fervada. Uh, often in this committee, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle complain about Washington's regulatory overreach with respect to the DOL's fiduciary rule. We've heard allegations that the Department of Labor has gone beyond its statutory mandate or outside its regulatory jurisdiction. Is there an indication that the DOL overstepped its statutory boundaries in promulgating its fiduciary rule? Absolutely not, and multiple federal courts have upheld that view. Is a regulation of investment advice in connection with retirement accounts within the scope of the DOL's mandate under the Employment Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974? Yes, it is, and it has extensive expertise doing so uh, and has developed dozens of prohibited transaction exemptions and enforces them, and through that has a lot of expertise that I think we're ignoring today in, in talking about the DOL's lack of expertise. That's right. Thank you for your response. I yield it back the balance. Gentleman yields back. Uh, with that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maine, uh, Mr. Poliquin, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. And thank you all very much for being here today. <clears throat> when someone is in the business of providing advice or services, I mean, it's common sense for all of us to realize that folks and firms are attracted to the biggest accounts. They just are. If you're an accountant, you want a larger business because they pay a bigger fee. If you're an attorney, you want a bigger client because they pay a bigger fee. And if you're in the business of selling real estate, you want to sell a half a million dollar home instead of a $200,000 home because your commission's bigger. So, I mean, it's just common sense. Now, if you're in the business of providing insurance products or retirement plan advice for savers, you're obviously still attracted to the larger accounts because they pay a bigger fee. This is common sense. I don't worry about folks who have large accounts. I really don't. They're going to do fine. They're going to get the best products. They're going to get the best advice. And they're going to do just fine. I'll tell you who I worry about. I worry about the folks that I represent in northern Maine. We have a highly rural state. We have a small number of large businesses. But we have the most honest, hardworking, small savers, small investors that you can find anywhere in our country. I worry about a single mom with two kids who's trying to put aside 25 bucks a week to save for her kids that might want to go to a community college and get an associate's degree. I worry about a teacher in Lewiston who's trying to make ends meet. I'm trying to, I worry about a, uh, a boat builder down East Maine who's trying to save for his or her retirement. Now, we know some of the facts here. We know that if you increase regulations in this part of our economy or any other part of our economy, the costs go up. And when the costs go up, it means the rate of return on your savings go down. It means your nest egg is smaller as you get older and enter the golden years. And we also know that the number of product offerings, the choices that you have, go down. And we also know 
that the number of firms that provide retirement advice go down because they're leaving the market. We know this. The facts are in front of us. You can't argue the facts. They are what they are. Now, my mom is 89. My dad's 87. I'm very close to my parents. I love them to death. They cannot use a cell phone anymore. So we heard today that if over-regulating this industry causes folks with small accounts, not the big folks, folks who have $25,000, $30,000 in savings, and they're counting on that so they can live in dignity for the remainder of their lives, they might have to go to a robocall. You gotta be kidding me. So okay, let's say you're 70 and you get a small account. What should your asset allocation be? Should you own some stocks or should you be all in fixed income? Because you don't have any more current income coming in, you're retired. Should you buy an annuity? Maybe all your money should be in cash and money market funds to pay those medical bills and you need access to that cash on a regular basis. Who's going to tell them that? Who's going to tell them? How about that single mom who's working two jobs at the diner and at the convenience store trying to save 25 bucks a week? Who's going to tell her how to invest that money? Here's what I worry about, Mr. Chairman, is that we have a potential here of so over-regulating the people that provide good advice to our small savers in this country, that you're driving away that advice, and if the advice is still there, you're driving up the cost so high that their rate of return over time is going down. That's who I worry about. If I get this right, Mr. Holstein? I think your concern is entirely well placed, sir. Mr. No Mr. Mr. Nock, am I pronouncing it right? You're in this business. Mr. O'Halloran, you're in this business. Have you fo you're in the business. Have you folks started to increase your account, minimum account size, such that the folks at the bottom aren't going to get advice, your advice? Or are your costs going up so far? Or is the liability so great because of these increased regulations? I'm out of here. And who's going to provide that advice? The little guy. Tell us you're in the business. As I mentioned, we have seen our, our financial advisors um, discontinuing service or serving the small marketplace. Okay, you Mr. O'Halloran, how about you? So we're in the manufacturing side. And the way I could speak to that is we, we like large accounts, but our wheelhouse is not there. Uh, we provide income products to people that need lifetime. And does this regulation hurt you providing that advice to small savers? They're not getting that advice. About there you go, products. Mr. Lombard. So one of the ways to avoid uh, the more onerous aspects of this is to move to a level fee account. Level fee accounts at my firm average 0.95%. Brokerage accounts average 0.55%. It's almost double the cost by sidestepping the more Let's onerous all, aspects. Let, thank you, sir. Let's thank you, Mr. Gentleman's Chairman. Time. Let's all get on the same page and agree with the facts. Gentleman's we do not expired. want to overregulate our small savers such that they lose the ability to plan for their retirement. Gentleman's Thank you, Mr. Time Chairman. has expired. With that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the panelists for helping the committee with its work. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a Wall Street Journal uh, opinion and commentary by Secretary of Labor Alexander Acosta uh, supporting the fiduciary rule and also a letter uh, to you and to uh, Ms. Maloney of New York uh, authored by Phyllis Borzi, the former Assistant Secretary of Labor for Employee Benefits Security Administration from 2009 to 2017. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate the comments of my friend from Maine, the beautiful state of Maine. Uh, however, it's a two-edged sword in this case where uh, you would also like the advice that is given to the most vulnerable investors, uh, AARP members, many of whom are here, uh, and it's a good thing you're here. It's a good thing you're here uh, to try to hold people accountable to make sure that uh, that future retirees, current right, retirees as well, are, are treated fairly under the law. But we want vulnerable 
uh, investors, those at the lower end of the investment scale, uh, to get advice that is in their best interest. And that's what the fiduciary standard requires. Uh, under the proposed standard in Ms. Wagner's uh, draft, a, a broker advisor could simply give advice to purchase or recommend the purchase of whatever product gives the highest commission, as long as it's quote unquote suitable. That's a very loose standard, and we've seen abuse in that regard. Uh, this has been a six year process, and, and it's been a long fight. It's been a long fight, and I, and I just wanna point out the simplicity of this. Those on our side, we would like investors, especially retirees, to get advice that's in their best interest. We, we would like to compel those who advise them to do so in a way that is in the investor's best interest. Most of the people in my district think this is already the law. They are shocked when they find out that brokers and, and advisors, financial advisors are not required uh, to act in their best interest and there is no fiduciary duty to do so. So uh, the, the, the visceral uh, opposition to implementing a simple fiduciary duty that requires advisors to act in the best interest of, of their clients, the opposition to that sort of makes our argument. We're asking for something very, very simple here. We're, we're asking that we maintain the integrity of, of our financial markets. We, we're asking to, uh, to persuade Americans to invest uh, in, in their retirement, especially. And we should do so in a way that actually is, is protective of those interests and protective of, of, of our retirees. And right now, that's not the case. Now, there's been a six year discussion between the SEC and the Department of Labor. They have worked together on this. Uh, the Department of Labor has had the, the statutory authority to define fiduciary, what that means, since 1975. I'm a former labor lawyer. Uh, I worked in ERISA quite a bit. Uh, this is the first time in, in the country's history that we're, we're changing this standard, and it's in response to the way the, the, the industry has evolved and the way products have evolved. Uh, the SEC uh, does not have many, any of the authority to, to, to manage or oversee many of the products that are being sold to our retirees each and every day. So the Department of Labor is, is the proper uh, uh, agency uh, to, to, to rule on this. Uh, I know that folks are asking for a delay, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think we've had six years of discussion. Uh, the American people have gone without this protection for some time now, and I think it's entirely reasonable that we go forward with this. Uh, I, I oppose uh, Ms. Wagner's uh, bill. I think it strips Americans of a basic protection that they need for their retirement. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. With that, the chair uh, recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, applaud the sponsor of the discussion draft for this bill. I think it uh, will provide some needed relief for a lot of investors. We saw this play in Great Britain. Uh, Mr. Holtz Eakin alluded to that earlier. Essentially, what this rule, fiduciary rule says is, if you're rich, it's okay. You'll be able to talk to a person if you are poor or middle class, you are at risk. You have to get what's called robo-advice. That means you talk to a computer, and it means you're not gonna really get real advice. You're, you know, imagine getting your investment advice from Surrey. That's what's gonna happen to a lot of poor and middle class people. The other thing that Mr. Holtzikin brought up is that millions of dollars of middle class and lower class investment savings are gonna be eaten up by fees and minimum balance requirements that they can't meet. There'll be extra fees and the cost of compliance is going to really hurt them. This is an issue 
for people of lower means in this country who are being hurt and trampled on by a giant government. I do want to admit to the record an article in Bloomberg about uh, AARP's role in this standard and, and what they did. I think it's important that we admit it to the record without objection. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, my first question is to Mr. Lombard to follow up on something the chairman asked earlier about the differences between the Security and Exchange Commission and the Department of Labor. Can you help us understand the difference in their expertise with regard to investment? Just in a brief explanation. I, I can comment on uh, the SEC's role. Uh, they've worked as our primary regulator since I've gotten into this business 35 years ago. Uh, during that period of time, I headed our advisory services. They audited our uh, advisory activities probably on uh, an every three-year cycle. Uh, so I've seen them. I have never had the Department of Labor uh, in as an auditor or an overseer uh, in the 35 years I've been with Johnny Montgomery Scott. Thank you, Mr. Lombard. And that speaks mostly for itself. Why is it that they've never come in and audited you? What is their role in investment? Well, their, their role deal uh, up until this point has been uh, limited to investment retirement plans, not individual retirement accounts. Let me be more specific. Do they have any role in regulating investments and appropriateness of investments? On the, uh, on the retirement plan side, I believe they do. In, in for individual investments and the choosing of investments, does the DO, Department of Labor have any expertise in that? I think that's what's being argued right now. The answer, I, I, I believe, is no, but uh, you know, I, I don't think that they have uh, a big experience in that. Mr. Halloran, um, well, can you well, tell me- Will the gentleman me, yield on that point, if, if, real, real briefly? Well, the gentleman I would, yield on I would be happy to yield. Uh, I, I, I know in conversations uh, that, that uh, Mr. Acosta has had at various times out publicly, he has said that the Department of Labor is ill-suited to do this and that the Securities and Exchange Commission does have that expertise. So I just wanted to make note of that. I will let the Secretary speak for himself, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for reclaiming may, my time. If I, if I may, no, however, No, ma'am, this is my time. You, you were asked some questions. Um, uh, Mr. Halloran, um, I'm curious if you believe the uh, current DOL fiduciary rule uh, disadvantages annuities uh, compared to other investments. Uh, significantly, actually. It, it, as I was stating before, you know, we don't typically serve the wealthy um, at least they don't have as great a need for that, this kind of product as middle class Americans do. Uh, we're talking with people with smaller balances that need to, you know, the, one, of the, one of the easiest things to do in investing is just to invest, is to accumulate. <laughs> That's not the hard part of the job, typically. And, and actually, in that respect, Americans have done a pretty poor, poor job. But then to take that money and stretch that over the rest of your retirement life and potentially two lives, that, that's a very difficult task. And that's precisely what annuities with living benefits do. These Thank you. So, so this are, rule essentially disadvantages a tool that many middle class and lower income people can use to preserve their retirement and their quality of life in retirement. Is that correct? Without question, we've already seen that. Thank you. I'll just uh, finish by allowing Mr. Holtzik and maybe to expand on um, what I talked about at the beginning about how this rule impacts poor and middle class people uh, and, and what it means to their future. Mr. Holtzikin. Well, I think it's a very simple story, which is the rule was intended to provide high quality advice, but that's only going to work if you get some advice at all. And the, the net impact of the rule is to put many of the the lower income, smaller savers out of the ability to get any advice at all. Gentleman's time Thank has you, expired. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. And uh, at the request of uh, the ranking member, uh, we do have a guest uh, here from, uh, from our full committee, but not on this subcommittee. Uh, and without objection, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Delaney, is permitted to participate in today's subcommittee hearing. And uh, Mr. Delaney is a member of the, of the full committee, as I had pointed out, and we appreciate his interest on this uh, topic. And uh, with that, I'm willing to uh, recognize you for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, permitting me to uh, participate in this hearing, and thanks for calling it. Uh, the reason I asked to participate is because I've been a strong supporter of the fiduciary rule, and, um, you know, I found this conversation very interesting because if you didn't know better, you would think the fiduciary rule prevents people from owning annuities. It, in fact, doesn't prevent people from owning annuities, for example. It, it discourages people from selling annuity products if 
when you include all the fees, it's deemed to be not in the best interest of the client. And I think there is somewhat of a broad agreement here that investment products that are in a client's best interest is a more um, important standard than the current standard, the suitability standard. I think in a perfect world, everyone here would agree that we would love for every client to receive investment advice that is in their best interest as opposed to just suitable. So the, but, so the issue seems to be that because of this rule, which, trust me, I agree, it would be terrific if the SEC would have put forth this rule. They do probably have more expertise in the area, but they didn't do it. And I think a, a future where the SEC comes up with a rule for all investment advice and we synchronize the uh, fiduciary rule from the Department of Labor with that could be a great outcome, but I wouldn't want to delay the Department of Labor fiduciary rule because it seems to be the forcing function to get the SEC to finally try to do something on this. So I, I, don't, I think that's a false choice. I think we can have the SEC do something on this, and then we can see what they come up with, and we could look at the fiduciary rule, and could, we could synchronize them in one standard. But what I find amazing about this discussion is the notion is that the current business model of, say, your firm, Mr. Lombard, and I am sure most of it, the overwhelming majority of your advisors do a terrific job for their clients. You, your firm has a great reputation, it's got a good brand, the name's on the door, and people wake up every day and do the best thing for their clients. But the issue with this fiduciary rule, in the eyes of three of the four uh, guests here, seems to be that for some reason, because of this rule, we will be left with a world that uh, it's all robo-advisors, and there's no innovation and there's no ad adaptation to this new standard. And that just seems so contrary to how we think about our capital markets and our entrepreneurial economy. Because as someone who started two financial services companies from scratch and took them public on the New York Stock Exchange prior to being here, and specifically started companies that focused on opportunities that was created by larger financial institutions who weren't adapting to the market's needs, either because they had legacy systems or legacy compensation structures or some legacy practices that made them hard to respond to the model. I guess my question for Mr. Lombard and Dr. holtz and I'm a huge admirer of your work, by the way, so thank you for being here. Why do you think for some reason that suddenly the private economy, the entrepreneurial economy of the United States won't take this new standard and if your firm can't respond with a high quality product where human combined with technology allows people to get advice at a best interest standard, why don't you think all kinds of entrepreneurs raising all kinds of private capital won't start all kinds of new businesses to exactly meet that need and outcompete you if you're stuck throwing your clients out of your firm or putting them on some automated Siri-like system? I mean, I, I just don't understand why you'd bet against the entrepreneurial economy of the United States. So Mr. Yeah. Lombard. So uh, we've already uh, made innovation. We've brought down our minimums on advisory fees fivefold, from $25,000 to $5,000. Uh, we still have upwards of 10,000 accounts with balances less than $5,000. We have certain fixed costs that those clients, if we charge those fixed costs to them, would pay an unreasonable fee. Right, so claiming my time back. So hearing that, I would say, okay, I'm going to start a new company without those fixed costs and out compete you and provide great service to these people. Why don't you think that'll happen? Because that's how it happens everywhere in this economy. And it's happening. Right. Dr. Eakin? So I, I have sort of two, Eakin, two responses. First of all, it's, it's a fantastic question. It's right on the mark. Uh, and, and there's a, a broad concern which is also going on in financial services, about the birth rate of firms in the U.S. economy, which has been declining steadily, yes. and which a few years ago actually fell below the, the uh, death rate of firms. And, and yeah. that's a, a troubling trend. And but there's so, other reasons for that. So I worry that the regulatory burden contributes to the inability to enter and provide the competition you're describing. I agree with you and, and I say this markets. lovingly. I hope you're afraid of going out of business every day. Do you want that kind of uh, competition? The second thing I'm worried about is exactly the mirror image of the concern that's been expressed earlier, which is how long does that take? And in the interim, what happens to everybody who had advice and is now gone? Transitions are tough, I acknowledge that, and we ought to be smart about that. But, but I just think that Gentlemen's, people will innovate out of this issue. Gentlemen's time and if we could expired. add, it's that innovation that's serving Sorry, the small Gentlemen's accounts. time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas at this point, uh, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the panel for being with us today. And, uh, you know, this is a subject I'm relatively new to Congress, only two and a half years, but I spent 35 years in the financial services business. And a good part of that 35 years was doing business with individual retail investment clients, both in a capacity of being a trustee and uh, running a trust bank operation, as well as a broker dealer. So I'm somewhat familiar with uh, uh, this issue and account sizes of all sizes, including the young young families starting out with just a few dollars a month. And uh, I've sort of grown irritated with the uh, previous administration and now this administration on, on this topic. And I really associate myself with many of the comments made by my friend from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Uh, at its heart, this is a failure of governance because the statute was quite, quite clear, asking the commission to do a study on this matter and then uh, recommending action. And it's a failure of the previous administration through its Treasury and OMB regulatory function to insist that the SEC and DOL work this out and create one uniform standard uh, in this arena instead of uh, creating the mess that we have now of expensive, duplicative, uh, conflicting uh, regulation. And to me, I've just called it part of the war on savings. DOL's done that by watering down the importance of long-term investment returns, by muddying up the definition of what's preeminent and looking for long-term returns. Uh, the previous administration proposed to tax and did tax investment income. They proposed to cap IRA balances, claiming that, that you couldn't save money unlimited in your IRA. Uh, people propose still today forcing people to Roth their IRAs, which I think uh, is a bad idea. And ultimately, because it's been so hard to save, even propose that the government set up savings accounts and cut out the private sector completely. So. Uh, it's been a disturbing trend in trying to encourage retirement savings. We should be doing everything we can to remove regulatory, paperwork, cost barriers to faster and better uh, retirement. And to also say that people aren't concerned about our seniors, I think uh, FINRA in the early 2000s led that work with uh, notice to members and sweep examinations across the whole investment industry on uh, breakpoints on mutual funds and educating consumers about that. Um, variable annuity product sales, how those should be done, what kind of accounts they're appropriate for, what kind of accounts they're not appropriate for, and then uh, sweep exams on investor sales practices for seniors. So uh, this is not a new issue uh, in the investment industry, and it should be done in the right way, which is through the SEC and the investment regulatory environment, coordinated uh, with whatever views labor has on ERISA uh, based accounts. A couple of things I'm concerned about. One, think of all the small broker dealers out there, small investment managers who are now told they were going to get a good delay of this rule and, and get improvements to it, have maybe the commission take a look at it with the incoming administration, our Trump administration, and then told no, it's going to go forward. So I've heard from um, uh, a lot of small uh, investment advisors in Arkansas uh, that fiduciary is not delayed by the end of August, companies will have to start spending millions of dollars to prepare for provisions of the rule that may actually go away or be changed. And I don't think that's fair. That's what I call the failure of governance to get this right on the front end. And then I'm concerned about this state law trend that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Halloran, if you, uh, I think on July 1st, uh, Nevada has a law going into effect on uh, fiduciary standards on broker dealers for all accounts, and other states are considering that. Again, that's going to create even more conflict in this space when we're trying to get a uniform standard that applies to uh, investment broker dealers, insurance people, and others in this space. Can you talk about how these state actions are inconsistent with the federal securities laws and what your concerns are on that? Yeah, sure. So we, we don't actually know everything about Nevada that we should. It's kind of vague in itself as well. But, but the greater concern here is, is that if you're looking for harmonization, which we think is a very good thing from a regulatory standpoint, then having 50 states doing 50 different things really doesn't help that in any, any regard at all. Certainly that increased cost. We deal with that from the insurance aspect all the time. We have 50-plus insurance regulators. 
that we have to deal with on a state-by-state -state basis every time we do something from an insurance product and so forth. So we know the difficulty in doing that. Uh, it works, you know, and, and it works slowly. But, but adding on legislative state actions to that just mucks up the water that much more. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for five minutes. Thank you to the chair and thanks to the uh, panel for being here today. Uh, I want to focus on uh, one specific area, probably because of my uh, professional background. Uh, and why don't we start with uh, Mr. Halloran. Would you agree with Secretary Acosta that the private right of action, the right to sue advisors and their firms, is the biggest flaw with the rule, the DOL rule? It is certainly, if not the biggest, among the biggest, yes. There appears to be some misunderstanding of the litigation risk under the DOL fiduciary rule. Many people say that the litigation risk will not arise until January 1st of 2018, but I've heard this may not be correct. My understanding is that a lack of clarity and certainty regarding the rule has created concern about a very substantial litigation risk for advisors starting on June 9th. Uh, again, Mr. Halloran, uh, could you explain? So the other, it's, it doesn't get a lot of you know, press or publicity, but uh, the actions by class have always been present in ERISA rule. By taking ERISA law and applying that to IRA accounts as an example, you're now exposing financial advisors even as of June 9th for potential class action litigation because just giving rise to uh, advice of moving out of a 401k, for example, rolling over to an IRA. So yes, that's, that's a real and present concern, um, absent any private right of action that arises from the best interest contract. You believe it's a real concern starting on June 9th? Oh, yes. Uh, also, as long as I've focused on you, why is the litigation risk so great under the rules as it's constructed? I mean, it'll, it'll, I'm just going to tell you, as a lawyer, a thousand pages makes it uh, a huge litigation risk uh, to have yeah, a rule Yeah, so that's a great point. I mean, you know, it sounds very simple. We want a best interest standard. We want to act in the best interest of our clients. The rule's a thousand pages. The preamble was 204 pages. There are many, many ambiguities we're still in deal with, notwithstanding changes that have been made, with, frankly, not a whole lot of guidance yet either. So there's, there's more concern about what we don't know necessarily than what we do know. Uh, we don't really have uh, case law to look to right now to understand the actual consequences of this private right of action and these kinds of actions. All we can look to is what we see in other businesses and, and it's, it's, it's a significant concern. And unfortunately, in order to get that body of case law, you're going to have to have a lot of people suffer in courts of law, and you're going to have to pay a lot of attorneys, which I suppose the bar is probably not too disappointed with. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Lombard, my understanding is, uh, and I'm hoping because of your relationship with the current chair of SIFMA, uh, my understanding is that SIFMA has conducted a survey of its members about the effects of the rule. Uh, are you familiar with that at all? In, in, uh, I, I'm aware that there's been surveys. There's been several of them. Uh, I'm not sure I can quote their exact uh, findings. Can you give me an idea? Do you know what the client experience has been to date and what effect the rule uh, has had on their ability to serve their clients? Well, as I said, there's already been disruption. There's limited uh, product selection in certain uh, areas uh, specifically fixed income. Uh, some of the members of SIFMA have stopped selling mutual funds. Some have stopped offering commission-based uh, brokerage accounts in the retirement space. Uh, as, as I also pointed out, uh, costs are rising as many firms ask their clients to move into fee-based accounts, which are more expensive than traditional brokerage accounts. Uh, the, uh, I think a, a lot of people agree uh, that the time has come or some kind of uh, fiduciary best interest rule uh, in this industry. Uh, but the rule as it's drafted, and I covered one area that's a big concern to me, and there are others, and unfortunately the way it works around here is we have to step in and out, so I'm assuming that people have covered some of these. Uh, but I guess I'd like to ask the panel, if the rule stays in effect, what changes would you like to see to make it more workable uh, to allow uh, advisors to sell products uh, and services that they offer their clients. And for me, it's the lower end, the entry level folks that uh, we're all concerned with. We want to make sure they get the right advice. 
I, why don't we just start on this end? So if the rule remains in effect, there are five, there are five specific things that the FSI would want to see changed in the rule. One would be streamlining the BICE documentation and disclosure. Second is creating a single best interest standard applicable to all investors. Third is revising and broadening the reasonable compensation rules. Four is revising the rules for IRA rollovers. And fifth is expanding the rules grandfathering provisions. And my time has run out, it looks like, so I'll be in touch to, with the rest of the panel. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, with that, the chairman recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. MacArthur, for five minutes. Thank you, chairman. Uh, you know, I really appreciated Mr. Scott's remarks earlier. Uh, there's not that many issues where both parties actually want the same outcome around here. You know, we debate a lot of things back and forth. This may be one of those areas. I don't, I don't see that much daylight between what any of us want. We want investors to be protected uh, with the optimal outcomes and the least cost. I don't think there's anybody on either side of the aisle that wants anything different. So if there's ever an issue for us to work together on and figure out the best way to get there, it seems to me this is one of them. I have a very basic question first for, uh, for Mr. Lombard. You mentioned in your opening remarks that your clients are confused by different sets of rules applying to investment accounts and retirement accounts. Uh, they're not alone in being confused. I, I like to think I'm a pretty so a sophisticated investor. I've made my living on investments for some years now. I don't understand the different kind of rules that apply. I don't think I have a good grasp on what the actual legal standard is for different kind of advisors. So if you could, uh, if you could help my ignorance, uh, for starters, I'd appreciate it. What are the current rules that apply to different kinds of investors, briefly? Uh, there is the suitability rule that applies to broker-dealer activities. There is the SEC fiduciary standard that applies to investment advisory activities. And now there is uh, the ERISA Department of Labor rule that applies to the retirement space that heretofore applied to uh, retirement plans, if you were deemed a fiduciary. Do you think most advisors are crystal clear on what their duties are as they deal with different kinds of clients? It's not just clients, sir. It's uh, also advisors, people that have been in the business for decades. Um, are just coming to grips with these uh, new regulations. I, uh, I asked maybe two, three months ago, my own advisors, I asked three of them what the uh, standards were that applied to them. Uh, none of them gave me a clear answer, which is why I'm asking you, none of them. They're all very smart. I mean, I rely on these people to not make too many mistakes with my investments. So we clearly need a, a uh, clearer standard. Is there anyone on the panel that doesn't support a single uh, standard? We support. ARP certainly supports a single standard as long as the standard is a fiduciary standard. And I would agree that there is confusion, and that confusion is creating the demand for a single standard. I think that is absolutely where the market is headed and where consumer demand is at. Okay, all right. Well, then, then it's obviously incumbent on all of us up here to figure out that standard with the most clarity and, with, and without uh, the potential for litigation. Because let's face it, that is a real issue. Uh, a, a, a single standard that does nothing but line the pockets of trial lawyers, either with individual lawsuits or class action lawsuits, isn't good for anybody. That's not good for your, you know, anybody. It's not good for... Uh... So I had a question, Ms. Favita, for you too. You, you mentioned before that you were okay, I think you were the only one who suggested you were okay with robo-advisors. Mm -hmm. Forgive me if you've addressed this, I had to step out. No, I would be very uh, happy to. I just want to better understand where you think robo-advisors are a better, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, tell me if I am, but do you think that that's equal to or better than a live advice? Well, we really appreciate the opportunity to expand on that, on that question, especially since the question of, of robo-advice has come up several times in this hearing. The, the point that, that we would like to make is related to the point that Congressman Delaney made. There is a lot of innovation happening in the products and services that are being offered. And some of those are technological in nature. 
So robo-advisors is part of the innovation that is helping serve Americans saving for retirement, especially at small dollar accounts. It can provide a lot of value, and it can provide fiduciary services. And I will add, I understand that everyone here except for myself said no, they, they, don't, they don't believe robo is a good idea, but many traditional firms are adopting robo services. The record is replete with examples of this, and those are, those are traditional firms that many of the organizations uh, t I, I testifying hate, today are, to uh, those are firms my, uh, that are members of those organizations. So my, I think robo services will be a part of the landscape, even for traditional firms. My, may my I time respond to that as well? My, my time has expired, oh, but I, uh, I will say just, I want to add this. I, there probably is a place for that, but let's not drive people away from uh, human interaction where a human being can really understand the needs of another human being. Let's not force people into that because we've, We've uh, ruled out the, the other type. Just one last thing, Mr. Chairman, if I can beg your indulgence. Mr. Lombard, uh, I didn't write down your answer to my question. I'd be grateful if you would send that to my office in writing. Be happy to. Uh, thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, this time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized uh, for five minutes, and I'm wondering if he would briefly yield to the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield to the chairman. Well, thank you. I uh, just wanted to, uh, I know that there was an answer to that, and I was hoping that you'd be able to allow that and indulge it, because uh, I, I got to tell you, uh, again, I love my mother, but she is not going to be on a computer to figure out how in the world she's going to manage her investments. She is not going to go through an, a voicemail tree when she is having a hard time and difficulty hearing it. It's tough enough getting prescriptions much less investment. So with that, um, I'll yield back to the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all. I've really enjoyed the dialogue that we've had here today. And I think it's an important issue that we address because we really do have to, to protect the ability of people to save for their retirement. Um, I guess my question is really basic in the sense that the premise, it seems to me that the premise of why you would invest in the market is you believe the market works. You believe that there is a path that would produce better investment alternatives than, and uh, therefore what is in the best interest of the, the saver is something that could be discerned through the forces of the market. And I just wonder if the premise of this assumes that these people that have money, I think we can agree without going down the line that it is their money that they're saving, <clears throat> that they can't know who they should trust without the federal government, in this case particularly, the Department of Labor, telling them who they can trust um, and saying, hey, we're adding another layer of regula regulation in this, so we need the federal government to tell us that it's okay to invest with these sorts of investors. We already have a lot of regulation from the SEC. This rule adds a layer, and as has been shared by a number of folks, um, the concerns, what happens to those savers. I talked with some an investment advisor, advisors in the 8th District of Ohio, and uh, here's a story. Daryl and Cynthia are a dual-income family, um, <clears throat> young couple in their early 30s with two small children. Both have solid careers and are making ends meet. A year earlier, Cynthia lost her job, and because she didn't have solid financial understanding, she withdrew roughly $20,000 from her 401k rather than rolling it over to an individual retirement account. After taking huge federal and state tax hits, they parked the money in a savings account at a bank and left it there for several years because they didn't know how or where to invest it. The couple knew the representative from their church activities and they sought his help after becoming frustrated with the very low return their money had earned in the bank. The financial advisor shared basic financial concepts with that couple that they had never heard about. Compound interest, the benefits of tax deferred IRAs, and why parking retirement savings at a bank savings account is not as good of a path as something with better yields. Daryl and Cynthia were frozen in fear because they lacked fundamental financial knowledge and made a bad decision by ca cashing out the 401k. They've now moved their money into a retirement option that's right for them, and they're making smart financial decisions with the input from their financial representative. 
Under DOL's fiduciary rule, millions of Americans like Daryl and Cynthia would be forced to fend for themselves and likely make similar mistakes like cashing out their retirement savings too soon, paying high fees and fines, which really alludes to some of the problems with ERISA in the first place uh, and puts DOL already at, at too central of a role in how people manage their money. As a former small business uh, guy, we use simple and separate IRAs, simple IRAs. And one of the concerns I've got is that many savers have this from small employers. Small, small businesses are a huge uh, part of the growth and employment in our country. Uh, Mr. Nock, how does the DOL fiduciary rule affect businesses' ability to offer services for small employer, employer retirement plans such as simple IRAs? Thank you, sir. I mean, I share the same concern you share as well. This is the area where we've seen the largest impact um, based on the, the prospect of the rule as well as its initial implementation. Simple IRA accounts at our firm are down 20% since 2016, and we forecast that simple IRA accounts will be down over 40% over the next 18 months. Thank you for that, and that's a big concern. Uh, I will mention as time flies by that in 2011, DOL estimated consumers who invest without professional advice make investment errors that collectively cost them $114 billion per year. To anyone's knowledge on the panel, has DOL factored these statistics into its economic analysis for the rule, and how would those costs affect the rule? And this has to be very quick. I'll answer that. I do not believe they have, and in fact, I think it's the single biggest flaw in the calculation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired uh, at this time. We uh, welcome the ranking member, the representative from California, who is recognized for five Thank minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I was not able to be earlier, uh, but it um, is very important for me uh, to be here because of the terrific fight uh, that we had to put up on fiduciary. This is a very important issue, uh, and of course, um, we had to go through quite a bit in order to, um, to make sure that the work that had been done um, at DOL uh, could be realized following an executive order uh, that was put forth by this president that delayed it. So uh, I did not think that we were going to have to come back and have this fight all over again, but it looks as if we have to. So I want to thank all of the red shirts out there. Uh, AARP, I understand, is here. Um, I'm so glad you're here to remind folks what this is all about. So with that, I'd like to pose a question to Ms. Christina Martin um, uh, Fabita. As you know, before DOL promulgated the fiduciary rule, rules governing investment advice on retirement accounts had not been meaningfully updated in 40 years. As a result, there are many loopholes or gaps in the law that allowed there were that allowed individuals to avoid fiduciary status and provide conflicted, uh, provide conflicted investment advice that cost our nation's workers and retirees $17 billion each year. Can you explain what those loopholes or gaps are and how they harm investors? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, so uh, as we stated in our, our, our uh, statement earlier, there has been a standard in ERISA for over, for over 40 years now to require fiduciary advice, but over the years there have been many exemptions developed by the Department of Labor itself, and those are the loopholes that the rule that was finalized last year, those are the loopholes that were closed in essence. Those were the loopholes that were revisited and we asked ourselves, in the current environment where, where so many individuals need to make so many decisions about their own nest egg because we no longer have the prevalence of defined benefit plans, do these continue to make sense? And the answer was no. And to your point, we have estimated that the conflicted advice that, that could result from those loopholes was costing savers five years worth of retirement income which is unacceptable because conflicted advice, again, is not free. There is, a, there is a cost to regulation. We recognize that. There is a cost to enforcement. We recognize that. But there is also a cost to conflicted advice. It is not free. There are two additional things that I would just like to add briefly because we have talked a lot about the litigation risk in this rule. And I'd like to make sure that we say today 
reminding everyone that the litigation that is permitted in the rule is class action litigation. And there's two things about that that we need to remember. First, there has to be a systemic problem before a class action cause of action can be brought. And I think that we can all agree that if there's a systemic issue in advice that's being provided, we would want to address that. So this is not about individual rights of action. This is about a systemic problem that affects a class. And second, it is extremely difficult to certify a class, extremely difficult and more so in recent years after certain Supreme Court cases have been decided. So I really just wanted to make sure that we were all clear on what is the scope of the litigation risk. Thank you very much. To any of our other witnesses who are here today, prior to the DOL's fiduciary rule, if an employee sought advice on a one-time basis to roll over the assets in their employer-sponsored 401k to an IRA, the person from whom she sought that advice would not owe her any fiduciary duty. Tell me, if you were transferring your life savings from your 401k, would you want your advisor to give you advice that is merely suitable, or would you want that person to be held to a higher standard, like the DOL fiduciary rule, where they would be required to act in your best interest? Who would like to answer that question? Mr. Mark Halloran? So I'd answer that by, first of all, it's not necessarily the case that that person giving me the advice would not be a fiduciary. They could be under the 40s Act. It could be an IRA, RIA. Secondly, I, I do think the suitability standard has been, is, is, is a pretty high standard. Uh, that suitability standard's changed six times from 92 to 2002, another four times most recently in 2011. What I want is a trusted advisor to give me sound advice, regardless of the suitability standard. We claim in my time, uh, since you think General suitable is fine, do you think that uh, fiduciary is better? The fiduciary standard is a higher standard under the law. Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady's time has expired. Uh, with that, uh, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, is recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here so much. I really appreciate all of the conversations and, and dialogue. I, uh, I'm reminded of a cartoon I saw a few years ago that made me chuckle. It's a, it's a gentleman sitting across from his financial advisor and a big desk in between him, and he says, I'm retiring next Friday. I have nothing in savings. This is your chance to become a legend. And I'm worried with this rule that too many individuals will find themselves in that same situation. And what's the reason? The reason we've talked about so frequently during the course of this hearing, which is we're not able to get people started early saving small amounts because of the way this rule change uh, in how the regulatory burden impacts small account holders and they'll be pushed out. And just a couple of examples of that that I've continued to hear from constituents, both financial advisors as well as those seeking out financial advice. One talks about how as a financial advisor, he's always prided himself on helping people getting started into retirement savings as early as possible and applauds individuals who come into his office. And just recently, he had the experience of having to turn away a young client who at 27 had the foresight to think he needed to start saving for retirement, but all he could put away was $100 to $150 a month. And this financial advisor, much to his chagrin, had to turn it away because his firm said that the new account minimum is going to be set at $5,000 on account of this because it didn't make any sense for somebody to save in retirement $100 to $150 a month if fees were going to eat up that entire principal, not the earnings on that, but that entire principal each and every month. And so the problem is, We've created this system now where people have to have significant funds and be able to have a significant account balance in order to get advice. And I think that's the great fallacy of overregulation. The people we're most trying to help, those that are most on the fringe and margin uh, of the financial system, we want to bring them in, but regulation continues to push them further and further away from getting good and reasonable advice. I want those people to participate. Second example comes from a financial advisor in district who has talked about how he has always worked hard to get people in the door, he even goes to local fairs and tries to advertise how people should be saving for their retirement. Even if they don't choose him, he sees it as his mission across the district 
to increase awareness for retirement savings because he doesn't want to see individuals come in and be that person and that gentleman in that cartoon. And he talks about how he's recently had to give up some of his licenses because he's worried about the potential liabilities because he doesn't know everything about every single customer that walks in the door. If they're trying to save three or $500, what they might have outside that they don't disclose to him and what that defense might look like. And he wanted me to ask a few questions. I know most of them have been um, reviewed already, but for Mr. Holtzikin, uh, does it make sense to have a rule become effective while that rule continues to still be under review? There's been a lot of confusion in his mind about whether this rule is going into effect, not going into effect, what he has to mail out, what he doesn't have to mail out, and he finds the situation really troubling for himself and his business, but also for the many clients. And so does this make any sense? Uh, there's a lot about the current situation that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's one of it. The fact right. that the SEC hasn't moved is another. There's a litany of, of failures that bring us to this point. The best thing would be to go forward with a single standard and clean that standard up. Right. The other thing that's really important to people back home in district, uh, which is a lot a rural district, where there's very little access to broadband, there's very little access to the internet. And this idea that robo-advice is going to fill the gap for these small individuals and that even without encouragement, they will go out and seek robo-advice and rely on robo-advice. These individuals don't have access to the internet. They don't have access to robo-advice. And so he wanted me to ask of you, does it, do we, are we concerned that robo-advice won't be able to fill the gaps for those that don't have access to the internet, who come in to see me face to face? Either they're in rural areas or they might be a, one of our senior citizens, but they don't have real and general access to the internet and thus need the in-person advice that I can provide, but I'm being forced not to provide through this rule. Yes. I, mean, I, I think the, the, the chief concern is not robo-advice, yeah. it's choice. People yeah. should get the advice which is best suited for them. Right. And pushing people away from having that choice is what I'm concerned about. Are we currently barred from offering fiduciary products right now? Does the law prevent us from offering products that have, that have a fiduciary standard right now? No. No. Right. That's no, correct. No so product, people no product is barred under the DOL rule. That, that's, or, or before the DOL rule, we can certainly offer fiduciary advice right now, and people can have that. It is about choice. What I think Hoosiers back home are most concerned about is that bureaucrats in Washington more and more are telling them what products they can use, what products they should use, and what products are best for their futures and families when they're the ones that know what's best for themselves and their own futures. And so I appreciate the panel today. But to be clear, in every gentleman's survey we've ever done, expired. nine out of 10 respondents Sorry, the want fiduciary time advice. Has expired, so you may ask uh, the next speaker for your time. Uh, gentleman from California has recognized Mr. Sherman for five minutes. We got this rule from an exhaustive process. The DOL con um, considered and then withdrew its 2010 proposal, went back to the drawing board, published an updated proposal in April 2015. For its updated proposal, they had a comment period of five months, receiving feedback including 3,000 comment letters, 300,000 signatures on petitions. They did more than 100 meetings with stakeholders, including the financial services industry, worker, retiree, and consumer representatives. The DOL also held four days of public hearings, which included 25 panels of witnesses and an opportunity for those not on a panel to submit written testimony. And there was an attempt to um, consistently to consult with the SEC. So it was a good process. Um, on the other hand, it was absolutely absurd that we have one rule for the SEC and a different rule for the Department of Labor. Either consumer protection is necessary or free fretted wild rest choice is necessary, but we actually ended up with the absurdity of greater restrictions and or greater protections on baby boomers with their IRA and rollover accounts than with people in the greatest generation who are in their 80s and 90s whose accounts are not in uh, Department of Labor regulated pr pr provisions. So we have an, a, a, a um, hard working process that leaded to a bifurcated consumer protection system. Um, Demo it's, uh, economists and uh, some of the democratic think groups are focusing on reducing cost and that does make sense. But if you want to just reduce the cost of ice cream, then require that, all, that only vanilla ice cream be sold. That's efficient. 
Um, you don't need an ice cream counselor. Um, it's vanilla ice cream. That would get ice cream to everybody as cheaply as possible, efficiently as possible, but people would eat a lot of less ice cream because it's pretty boring. Uh, by providing 31 flavors, Baskin Robbins demonstrates that if you want people to save, you've got to give them interesting choices as to how to save. And the focus here ought to, ought to be on how to get people to save more for their retirement because Social Security is not sufficient. Um, now let's get more to the, the details here of how we apply a rule. Um, I'll ask uh, um, uh, Ms. Uh, 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 Vervita, um, uh, do you have any concerns that the fiduciary rule could have an unintended consequence of limiting the ability of small financial institutions, uh, small banks, credit unions, to provide IRA rollovers and other uh, uh, savings opportunities? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, our biggest concern really is not from the perspective, given who we are, not from the perspective of who is offering the services, but from the perspective of the client. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we understand is there's going to be some disruptions to the marketplace, and some of those disruptions are beneficial, many have been, for those saving for retirement. So we would say small account holders, which is what I worry about, and many of them are going to smaller uh, vendors, are coming out ahead in this rule. And that is beneficial uh, to them and to their retirement, and it is one of the reasons why we support this rule. Okay. Uh, Dr. Holtz, uh, you can... You can... I, I have repeatedly said exactly the opposite, which is my concern is for those same small account holders and that the combination of the fee-based uh, accounts and the litigation costs will in fact make investment advice unavailable to them. Mm -hmm. And um, what is, uh, are people going to be subjected to just robo-advice uh, under this rule or are they going to be able to talk to a human being? That will depend on uh, what kind of person you are and the size of your account. As is, has been noted, if you're an affluent investor with a very large account, this, this is not going to change your ability to get that advice. The people most at risk are the smaller savers. Mm -hmm. As I noted in my testimony, uh, if you set the threshold at uh, $20,000 minimum balance in an IRA, that's about 42% of people who would not uh, be able to qualify for that. Well, I'm deeply concerned about that. That's people would be able to get a bank account IRA, but they might not be able to get other uh, other other flavors. So we uh, know that they would not get the current advice they get, and they would be thrown into an unknown regime, and that, that's the concern. They chose this set of advisors, and and the rule does not allow them to keep them. And I think as regard to robo, we, we had a discussion a, a little bit earlier where we do understand that many traditional firms are adopting robo services in addition to what they already offer and that we believe the landscape in the future will include a combination of both, even at traditional firms. So we, we think the, that's the, probably is, where this is going. There is the argument that if you're only saving $10,000 and you get $500 worth of advice every year, Maybe that's too much advice for the amount of money you're saving. But if you get 500 bucks worth of advice every year, you're going to pay 500 bucks one way or another. And we've also discussed that, of course, conflicted advice is not free. The uh, chair was not paying attention. <laughs> we are, time has the comments expired. Comments were scintillating. Yes, they were. I was, I, as, as that, always, that the gentleman. That distracted you from the clock. You were paying yes. attention to the. Uh, yes, yes. I, I actually was, uh, uh, Representative. So the, uh, the, the gentleman from California often does have insightful, uh, insightful questions. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we will uh, recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Pleased to have an opportunity to participate here. This is a big issue in my district. I've had several town hall roundtables about it. So under the final rule, this final fiduciary rule, one size fits all from the federal government, if an investor likes their broker, they can keep their broker. Will the DL rule harm Will the DOL rule harm investors? May I, may I answer that question? Sure. My dad likes his broker. My mom likes his broker. My mom and dad received a letter about three weeks ago saying that they are no longer eligible to work with their broker. Um, 
I'm probably eligible for AARP. Certainly they are. That's, that's the crux of this issue here for, for us. Is it's, it's, robo-advice is not bad. Robo-advice, frankly, was introduced many years before the DOL. Firms are embracing robo-advice. If you don't do that, you do it at your peril, frankly. It's a matter of choice. My parents would love to continue to working with that trusted advisor that they've been working for for the last 15 years. They can't, not unless that advisor leaves that firm. I received a similar letter, if not the same letter. And in my case, I actually qualify for the fee for service. But what I would have to do is I would have to take my account, which I'm averaging about 25 basis points paying for right now, getting advice, and for the same advice from that same advisor, pay at least 75 basis points more. That's my choice right now. This is not about, this, these are interesting academic arguments, frankly. The, the argument that Mr. Delaney put forward that annuities are permitted, sure they're permitted under this rule. Are they going to be sold? No, they're not being sold because they're disadvantaged by the rules bias towards fee for service. It's about what's happening. It's about what's happening today, not what's potentially going to happen. We're seeing it every single day. Thank you. I, I'd like to kind of, as a follow-up related question, I'd like to direct this one to Mr. Lombard. Um, has, in your opinion, has the DOL, or just factually, has the DOL substituted its judgment, its own judgment, the DOL's judgment, for that of the expert regulator of the broker dealers? And, you know, as a follow-up, will the end result for investors be a loss of choices in product services of financial professionals? It's my opinion that the Department of Labor chose one business model, that of level fee advice, advisory, over the traditional brokerage account, even though that doesn't fit for every client. And it's not just a matter of size. There are clients of substance that prefer, as my uh, colleague here does, to keep their costs low. And that's not possible in advisory programs. So again, it comes down to choice, and the DOL is forcing the hands of investors and providers to offer one in favor of the other, whereas before, investors had choice. Dr. Holtz-Egan, I see you nodding your head there, and so one more follow-up here in the remaining minute and a half that I have. You, you referenced the UK Retail Distribution Review in your testimony as a comparison to the DOL fiduciary rule and how the UK Financial Conduct Authority in 2016 conducted a review of that rule. What caused the UK to initiate the review? Uh, th there was concern about the fallout from the 2013 decision to ban uh, commission-based accounts. And when they looked, they found uh, probably three striking results. Uh, the first was a about a quarter of the advisors had exited the industry, and, and we've seen some exits in the US already. Uh, they found that uh, about 45% of the firms no longer provided uh, advice to small accounts at all, and, or very rarely, so that there was a, a clear uh, departure from advice, either because the advisors were gone or because those that remained weren't talking to small account holders. And we saw minimum balances go up. As I said, 13% uh, uh, of firms initially required 100,000 pounds or more. That moved up to 32% in only three years. It's exactly the kinds of concerns that have been expressed about the DOL rule. Well, but supporters of the rule have stated that the DOL rule will not have a similar impact to that of the UK rule. Do you agree with that? Why or why not? Uh, we've seen some of the um, early evidence. Some members of this panel have talked about it, and I mentioned some examples in, in, in my testimony where, for example, MetLife and AIG have exited the business, and we've seen Raymond James move, move to fee-based uh, accounts, and this is exactly the, the sort of early indicators of the pattern that emerged in the United Kingdom. And so I don't think these are hypothetical or academic or theoretical arguments. This is an experience that we saw in the UK and we're beginning to see in the United States. Thank you. I mean, I think the facts show that these, some of these rules are well-intended, but they have the exact opposite effect. They hurt the very people you're trying to help. It's a shame we do the, that. So the gentleman yields back, and I, I guess I'll just note that it, see, it strikes me hearing this as just fewer advisors giving less advice with greater government control and less choice for consumers. And uh, that ultimately, we've got to make sure that uh, consumers are protected and that they've got the ability to go, what to do, go to do what's best for them. So 
Um, I, uh, I deeply appreciate the time and the effort for all of our panelists being here. Um, that uh, it was, a, I felt, a very informative and great uh, panel. Uh, without objection, I do have a couple of letters. I'd like to submit the following statements for the record. Uh, one, a letter from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, the other one from the National Taxpayers Union, and the third from the Credit Union uh, National Asso Association, CUNA. Uh, without objection, uh, those are um, uh, those are submitted. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions uh, uh, for the witnesses. They will write them to the chair, and we will then forward them uh, to you all uh, for your responses. And I uh, kindly ask that our witnesses uh, please respond in a, uh, an appropriate and prompt, uh, timely fashion, if at all possible. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to uh, submit extraneous materials uh, to the chair for inclusion in the record uh, as well. And uh, again, I want to appreciate or say thank you and, uh, to our panelists and appreciate that. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>